All right, so I just want to start by thanking everybody for joining another session of our community collaboration. So this is part three. So we are covering parenting a child with ADHD. Um, and at least I'll kind of let you take it over from here since this is your wheelhouse and your specialty. We appreciate you being here with us today. Sure, let me share. Oh, yep. All right. So today I just want to talk about what is ADHD, social emotional development. I'm going to look at ages five through probably 12. Um, what are the variations in ADHD, executive functioning um, skills, some red flags, and some mild, mindful parenting techniques and alternatives to medication. Keeping in mind, I'm going to try to talk pretty general, and um, that means that it may not specifically apply to your child, but it's just general understanding of ADHD in itself. So um, there are three types of ADHD. Um, if you're my age or older than me, you probably heard of just ADD and then ADHD. So that no longer is a thing. There is no ADD anymore. It is simply ADHD and attentive type hyperactive and com combined. So hyperactive also means impulsive. So for that kid that will think, um, act without thinking, they cannot stop, and they want to touch things, they say things um, before it filters through their that filtering ability in our brain. Um, that's usually that hyperactive, impulsive child. Um, this kid has a lot more body in energy. So when we think of like hyperactive, we're thinking body energy, whereas in, in attentive type, we're thinking a lot of mental energy. So that kid may not be bouncing off the walls. They may not be super excited, running here and there, talking excessively, um, but that kid has a lot of things going on in their mind. So racing thoughts, um, lots of bouncing from ideas to ideas in their mind. This also looks like laziness um, or that kid that procrastinates a lot or will be afraid to start something because that they know it's going to take them in a really long time. This kid also probably has um, more slow processing speed. Um, and you hear me say may or may not because that that's not true for all kids. Just because you're in attentive type does not mean that you have slow processing speed, but I've seen it from more majority of kids with that slower processing speed. Um, ADHD in general typically has a slower processing speed, um, but for the inattentive type, you can kind of see their slower and movement, um, slower to do things and um, have more lagging skills. Then you have the combined type, which means that you have a, the inattentive and you have the hyperactive type of ADHD. There may be a part of um, the child that seems a little bit more hyperactive and impulsive than the inattentive, but they're both present. So that lets you know that those both areas are there. Um, a lot of kids, uh, a lot of boys typically tend to be more hyperactive. Um, this is just based on the data. Um, girls more inattentive, but that doesn't mean that girls don't have the inattentive type. It just means that research base, um, boys are typically more hyperactive. And overall with ADHD, there are more diagnosed boys than there are females. Um, but we're learning as we continue to gather more information, girls also have, a lot of girls are diagnosed, but they were just misdiagnosed before or underdiagnosed. So having the ability to understand ADHD now has been able to um, filter out some of those girls that maybe just appear to be super anxious um, or, Dramatic is a word that used to be used before, but they actually are experiencing more ADHD symptomology. Um, and so that's a brief kind of overview. ADHD is an executive functioning disorder. Um, so what that means, it's neurodevelopmental. Children are born with it. It's not something that you acquire over your lifetime. Um, when I talk to parents, typically they will recognize, oh, I had ADHD. So it's not like when they were an adult, all of a sudden the ADHD started. Um, ADHD happens before a child is born. It's more of, um, like I said, neurodevelopmental, which means you're born with it. What will happen sometimes notice or be, may not be detected before the age of, usually before third grade or 
detected at age seven and beyond because that third grade usually is typically more challenging. Um, that's more challenging because of the curriculum is different and they're able to read. They're focusing on more reading and reading comprehension. So when you start to notice those assignments and things in school, um, kids start to struggle a little bit. Uh, ADHD can be diagnosed um, prior to the age of seven. Typically, they try to wait just to make sure that it's not a disability or a type of other anxiety, uh, but there's lots of kids that can get diagnosed before the age of seven. But keeping in mind, we're looking at neurodevelopmental disorder, and it's an executive functioning disorder. And there are different types of um, ADHD, or not different types, but there's different variations. So. When we're looking at intellectual, biological, social, emotional, um, and lagging skills, this is going to differentiate. So a child may have different intellectual abilities than their actual biological age. So when we look at development, oftentimes we're looking at the age. So a six-year-old um, may exhibit these type of intellectual abilities for this age range in development, but their biological it should match their biological age, which means it would be synchronized development. What happens with ADHD or children that are gifted or have autism is they have asynchronized development, which means that it's off balance. Um, there's something lagging, and that's why you get those lagging skills. So a child that may have a higher IQ, um, maybe like 100 even here, even just high average overall. They have those abilities, um, and they may be operating as, say, a seven-year-old operating as a 10-year-old cognitively. Um, you have to look at, well, intellectually, they are functioning in what parents usually tell me, mature. Well, they're so mature. So yes, they have the cognitive abilities, but they're actually seven years old. So we have to look at their biological age, age and other areas of functioning. And then you have the social emotional. So if we're still looking at this seven-year-old child, their biological age is seven. Cognitively, maybe they're functioning at a nine-year-old. Um, but since I have ADA, I'm going to function probably as a five-year-old um, if, if they are seven, so two years behind. That is the typical time frame when we look at ADHD and social emotional functioning. We're looking about two years behind. Um, some kids are a little bit more, maybe years, or they could be one year, but that is like the overall functioning that we're looking at. So social emotional means emotionally, how I'm able to express my feelings, how I'm responding, um, how I'm writing feelings. Um, the social part is how I'm interacting with peers, my social skills. So why is it that a kid with ADHD is going to have two years behind in their social emotional functioning? It's a great question. Um, a lot of people don't understand that, but if I'm inattentive or hyperactive for the social part, I'm missing cues. So as we've developed, children often are not given a book or learn in school, like typically they do now more, um, but they don't learn how to pick up on facial cues and social nonverbals, things that allow us to communicate so much more than just language, right? So we have language, but we also have nonverbals. And if I'm inattentive, which I'm not paying attention, I'm daydreaming in my own world, this person is having a conversation with me, I lose that time of development to focus on reading somebody's social cues right, and understanding what that means and interpreting that. So when we're developing, a lot of what we're learning is from modeling or interacting with people, whether it's our parents or other peers. Um, in the social aspect, kids learn how to have relationships with peers by being around peers. They can be around their parents, but it's not going to be the same. So for that hyperactive kid, I just described like inattentive, I'm daydreaming, I'm not focusing, I'm often la la land, um, and I cannot pay attention to this conversation or this person or doing this play. Um, if I'm hyperactive, I'm thinking about what I have to say. Um, excessive thoughts, thinking I want to say so many different things. I haven't picked on this, picked up on this kid that really is not interested in what I have to say and has probably turned their shift of their eyes. And that's kind of an indicator of like, I'm not paying attention or I'm not listening or I'm not interested. But that person constantly keeps 
focused on what we call excessive talking. Um, so they are thinking that that person is paying attention or they're engaged, but they're really not. Um, this can also look like not picking up on empathy or understanding um, how a child um, is going to display that empathetic um, response to a peer or even understanding like if somebody think kind like tone of voice body language like all of these nonverbals. if I'm not paying attention I will miss and if I miss them then I don't learn them um, and that's really important in development because that we're not being constantly taught these things um, from like a teaching language perspective. We're visually learning these things, picking up on cues. And if we miss those, we're delayed. So that's where that two year time frame comes from, that kiddo is probably delayed two years. So knowing their um, biological age may be seven, they're actually functioning as five. So if a kid even has a temper tantrum, um, or is having trouble being friends, or they're even playing with children that are much younger than them. A lot of times that's what kids with ADHD will do. They'll play with a younger crowd uh, because of their functioning at that level and it's easier for them. So they fit in with that group a lot more than they would fit in with their own group. Uh, and that could even look like the older kids that are 14 or 15 babysitting younger kids um, and liking to be around those kids that they babysit because that they can get along with them a lot more. So the intellectual versus um, social emotional, which I was oh, not finished. <laughs> can you go back to the, yeah. um, the intellectual versus the social emotional? Um, like I said, if that kid is functioning higher, um, your expectation naturally as a parent is going to be like, well, they're cognitively advanced or even high average. Um, their intellectual age is nine. Um, why are they having these temper tantrums? Why are they being explosive? Um, why are they not able to regulate their emotions? Um, why can't they make friends their own age? This doesn't make any sense. So keeping that in mind, there's that discrepancy there. Um, and there's those like number three, the lagging skills. So everything that I'm talking about is pretty much a lagging skill. Um, and that word lagging skills comes from Dr. Ross Green. He is the psychologist that really is heavily focused on ADHD. So if you're interested, definitely look him up. Um, I'm pretty sure he has a podcast, but um, lagging skills is his coined term. So I'm just going to give you a few examples um, so that you understand what that means. So difficulty maintaining focus, difficulty handling transitions, um, difficulty with uh, persisting challenging tasks, um, struggling with a range of like problem solving solutions, um, expressing concerns, needs, or thoughts, thinking rationally, um, responding to frustration. So these are just a few. Um, there's about 15 that he has coined as like lagging skills. But ultimately, if I am struggling with social emotional functioning, I'm probably going to have a lot of lagging skills. Uh, um, and what I usually do with my parents when working with them in parenting, um, I have the parents identify their own lagging skills. So you, and it's a piece of paper. Um, if you just Google Dr. Ross Green lagging skills, a uh, sheet will come up and you can kind of do uh, the rating form for yourself and for your child. You can probably do it for your whole family. And you can see where you guys might butt heads. So if I'm a parent of a child that has ADHD, one of you is highly probable to have ADHD, one of the parents. Um, the, gen the genes there, there's a lot of research indicating that there's a high genetic factor. Um, there's not anything that says ADHD equals like a parent having it, but there's a high genetic factor. So just keeping that in mind. Um, adults often that have never been diagnosed don't always recognize that they had it because that they've learned how to cope over the years um, their own way and there wasn't help before. But once they sit down and see their kid and recognize like these are similarities or these are issues that I used to have as a kid, then they start to notice like I also experienced these things but I've coped with it so well over the years. Um, but when you're dealing with your child, what may happen at times is those triggers or it, your issues um, that you've coped with so well in other situations situations become a little bit more challenging because your kid may be experiencing the same thing. So either there are similarities or 
um, you have a strength in some areas and your kid has a weakness in those areas and you can do really well. But my main recommendation is to look at your own lagging skills and then see what your kid's lagging skills and see where there's either matches or mismatches. And when you find a match, you're going to have a harder time in that area with your kid. And one of the examples could just be um, initiating tasks. So if you have a really hard time initiating tasks and your kid does too, but you expect them to initiate tasks and you're not able to help them do that and you're not consistent. Um, and then you get mad at your kid for not initiating a task. And this could be homework. This could be a chore. This could be anything in the home. Um, then it's kind of like, well, they don't have a model to do that because if you're struggling in that area, you're not able to model it well for them. So knowing your areas of weakness, and if you have a partner in the home, um, if that partner has a strength, then that partner probably will do better at modeling for that child what is needed to be modeled. Um, so that's just a small example of um, lagging skills and then intellectual versus biological and social emotional versus intellectual. So. I hope that's a good um, description of that. It can get so much deeper, but the main takeaway is lagging skills and developmental asynchronization. Okay, go to the next slide. All right, so I'm just gonna give like a few descriptors of like social emotional for um, ages four to six, eight to twelve, and then probably touch on twelve to eighteen. Um, but it's really helpful to know about what developmentally is appropriate for each age range because what can happen is parents may have unrealistic expectations of their child in general. And then if their child has lagging skills like we just discussed, so they're two years behind, um, your expectations will probably need to be significantly reduced um, just by a few years. So for a kid that's four years old example um they're mastering like imaginary re reality skills um, they have really strong intense emotions they need adults to help them find um, and express their emotional needs um, they may throw temper tantrums um, they can be really aggressive towards their um, siblings they increase they're increasing their ability to share and take turns um and they want to please others and they're able to play um with kids that are like three or four years old so if you have a kid that's seven years old and they have adhd um they may be functioning at that four or five year old level so being able to know well what does a four or five year old really function as and that's what i should be seeing my kid as, and not to say that, oh, I just kind of give up and let them function at this level, but just shifting your expectations so that you have a better understanding about really where they are at and helping them meet their expectation of where they are currently at so that they can get to that biological age. Um, and that's to say, it's not to say that just because that they're lagging means they'll never get to that biological age, it just means that they're gonna need some extra help. So four or five and six year olds just struggle a lot with um, emotional expression. Um, that's a big thing just in general for the age range. And this, these kiddos also struggle a lot with um, areas of empathy and self-centeredness because naturally and developmentally, they're very self-centered. <laughs> they're self-centered. Um, they're ego, we, we call it egocentric, which means that they're all about themselves. And this is normal and this is okay. Um, they don't have the ability to perspective take, which means like put myself in somebody else's shoes or really understand genuinely how that person is feeling. They're learning all of those skills, but it's not developmentally just there and very strong at this point. So when you think of a seven-year-old with ADHD and they seem a little bit self-centered or they seem a little bit like they're always focused on their self, just like, okay, well, developmentally for a four through six-year-old, that's normal. So, okay, they're at the right point for what, what ADHD is, how it's impacting them in their life. Um, so lots of emotions, temper tantrums, meltdowns for this age range. I'm trying to get to have interactions with peers 
and children of their own age and understanding those social cues. So learning all of that. Um, they're picking up on lots of things that parents are saying, teachers, they're internalizing things. They're starting to develop their personality and create some autonomy. So through eight through 12, um, at this age, they're the preteen age. So social, those social environments matter a lot more to them. They have developed more autonomy. Um, they're more able to communicate their wants and needs um, and communicate emotional expression. But if they're having ADHD, keep in mind, they're focusing a little bit less than that age range. Um, hormones may start, start you know, they're not there, they're not a teenager yet, but they're going to start to initiate, which may to some degree start to impact their mood, um, their ability to integrate with others. There may be some beginning of isolation. It just depends. Um, and when you're working with females or um, biological girls, then there's going to be a lot more difficulties too <laughs> around this age range um, with a child that has ADHD, just because that there are more hormones in play that really do impact their overall ADHD symptoms. So um, more moods, shifting in moods, and that's already kind of normal, just the shifting in moods. So it just increases a lot more. Um, there may be more anxiety and more depression for them to experience due to the mood shifts and just being wanting to be around their friends and being feeling more rejected by those friends and friend groups. So those are all pretty typical for that age range for girls and 12 through 18 years old. I mean, the hormones are fully fledging here. Um, this is the time frame for a lot of ADHD kiddos. It's very hard. Um, it's hard because they may be on medication. Um, and if they're not on medication, there's just a lot of development that's going on. They're trying to have their independence. Uh, and there's a lot of requirements at school. So you have a lot of difficulties in the school environment. You have difficulties at home. Maybe they're not meeting expectations of parents. They're experiencing all those lagging skills that we just talked about um, emotionally and socially in those environments. And the social skills that they have probably are not as strong and they're probably struggling in those environments more. So there's a lot more depression in this state of functioning for kids that experience ADHD. Um, I didn't specifically talk about like each normal development for each stage, but more so like what this would look like if a child did have ADHD um, or a kid did have ADHD at these specific um, time points in time. So they are going to be different uh, and that is normal <laughs> and knowing that um, they're going to change as they continue to develop with each stage. And something that I didn't mention is a lot of times when we think of temper tantrums and meltdowns, um, we think of those as very like abnormal and kids shouldn't do that. But um, toddlers and infants, that's their way of communicating, right? So anytime a kid has a behavior, the behavior is a way of communicating to somebody a want or need. And oftentimes they're trying to connect. They're trying to find connection. They're trying to be seen and they're trying to be heard and they don't know how to do it. Um, in general with ADHD and all these different, um, developmental years, emotional expression is just hard because you're looking for the words, you're looking for a way to identify and communicate to that other person what your need is. So if I don't have the language, I'm going to use whatever language I do have, which could be really rude and mean, um, or I'm going to communicate it with my body. Um, and that could be crying, that could be hitting myself or um, trying to hit a parent, um, whatever that looks like. It's a way of communicating and they're doing their best at it. So trying to figure out what is their need. Um, and you as a parent are going to be modeling like all of this stuff. You're modeling for the child um, how to communicate with increasing language. I work with a lot of my parents on if we use we have three words that express emotions in our household. I mean, that is limited. And that means that's what your child has. And if they don't have a vast vocabulary of language to communicate that to you, it's really hard. Um, we can't use the word frustrated for every single situation. And we can't use the word overwhelmed for every situation because there's more words that have more descriptions. And if I can't identify that, I can't really help you understand what my needs are or what's going on to help me. Um, so I would expand language to help with the emotional expression 
And also for kids, like the little kids, like emotional regulation is something that they're definitely learning. Um, the twos age two and up, they start to learn that more, but they still need their parents. So if I have, I have a six-year-old or a five-year-old with ADHD, they still need my, I need my parent to self, to self-soothe. I'm not having the, I don't have that ability yet to do that fully. Um, so expecting them to do some deep breathing skills by themselves may not work. Um, they may need a parent to sit in front of them, to ground them. Maybe I put my hand on your shoulder to kind of distract your mind from whatever emotion that is to start the deep breathing. Um, or to just, I need a hug. I need pressure. Um, some kids are sensory stimulated or they have sensory concerns. So they may need something in addition, but they need your help. They may not be able to initiate that on their own. Um, so you would be doing what we call like um, stepping in to be their frontal lobe, you know, um, when they're having big feelings, they're operating in a much lower brain level functioning, the reptilian brain, which is like really small. Um, and then to be able to get back to their frontal lobe, they need a lot of help. Um, and that's where parents come in to really help them do that. Um, and then over time, the goal is for them to be able to do some of those things themselves. But as a parent with your kiddos, and it's definitely depending on the age, but if they haven't got a lot of help um, in starting getting them help, you are their executive functioning skills and you are their frontal lobe to start off. And then as you get, as they improve, you know, you can start to step away. But a lot of the times in the beginning, um, you're doing a lot of the work for them, whether that's time management, whether that's helping them transition, um, whether that's helping them um, find the coping skill they need for that moment, and whether that's helping them with the language to communicate. Um, all of those things do require a lot of parent assistance in the beginning. I'm going to unmute for just a second. Um, for some of you that joined late, I just want to remind you, especially because we had a little bit of a slow start, that in less than a minute, this is going to close, but you're just going to click that link again, and we're going to rejoin and keep going. So don't be startled if and when that happens. Um, yes. So I kind of touched on some of these already, but reason I mentioned red flags is because sometimes with if you have a child with ADHD, some of these um, situations just seem like this is not okay. Why is my child always tattletaling? Um, one of the biggest ones is like narcissistic behaviors. Um, when I say that, that really just means that it seems like they're bragging a lot. Um, they're always talking about themselves. They seem to be really focused on how great they are. Um, Um, that often looks like bragging or focusing on myself, um, making myself seem great. Um, I'm compensating. That's what I'm doing. I'm compensating for, I know that I probably struggle in certain areas and if depends on the age, um, with the littles, it's not always as common, but it definitely can be. I've had four-year-olds that do this, but at a certain age, like they start to notice they're different. At a certain age, they also start, they're more aware of, um, I'm not able to function like my peers. I'm being called out a lot. I'm struggling with um, paying attention or keeping still or being able to complete a task. So once I notice these things about myself, I'm going to compensate. And I'm going to compensate by telling everybody what is so great about me <laughs> um, because I feel like other people don't see it or I'm struggling. I want to feel better about myself and I want you to see me as feeling good about myself too. So if your kid has ADHD and you notice that, don't be alarmed. Like they're doing it for a reason. They're, they, they're just trying to feel good. They just want to feel good about themselves and have a positive self-esteem. That's definitely something that we can work on by pointing out um, how they are great. But in a conversation, if you're on a play date with a, another parent and you notice your kid doing that, something that you can definitely do is um, encourage them in the beginning to ask the other person questions, um, ask them about themselves. Um, you can always like give them 
think of something that they like to do. So you already have questions prepared. This is being their frontal lobe, right? You have questions prepared that they can ask uh, so that you can see that that kid can notice that that other kid cares. Because without that, I'm just like this kid that walks around bragging and talking excessively. And I just care about myself. And it's like, well, that's not a friend. You know, a friend is somebody that engages in social reciprocity. So back and forth conversation. Um, I'm, I have ideas ideas and they're great. And then I also want to know about your ideas and what you think about yourself. Um, I apologize. I do not know how to cut off notifications on my phone. I mean, on my computer. Um, so keeping that in mind. And one other thing is like letting them know that they do have great areas. But if we talk about those all the time without asking the areas that the other kid may feel confident in, um, that kid may start to feel like you don't care. So you're kind of helping them see, you're, you're helping them with perspective taking skills, right? Naturally, those may not come to them because they haven't paid attention in the social environment to pick up on those cues. So you're giving them description, descriptions of like, when you say this or when you say that, the other person may feel like this or they may think um, and as the parent it can be really helpful for you to step outside of like well what about this or what about that because that that indicates that you don't think that they're great or you have a judgment against them and you're the parent and you really want to maintain that parent-child relationship so you said if I was a friend if I were Johnny if I were Rachel if I was anybody who whoever else how do you think that I may feel when you keep talking about this, or would you be interested to hear about my side of the story? So I know I just said, how does that make you feel? Um, try not to do that as much. <laughs> that was just a reaction um, from me, uh, but don't always ask them, well, how does that make that other person feel? That can get really redundant and repetitive over a certain amount of time. So try to think of um, a question that you may want to ask them or what do they think? Um, how do you think that they will respond? Or just give the feeling. Like, do you think that Rachel would be super excited to know that you think you're the best at everything and that's all you keep talking about? Do you think that Rachel would feel really excited to keep talking to you? So you're asking a question back and it allows them to process and to think without you giving the answer. Um, and then they learn better like that because sometimes if I just give you the answer all the time, then I'm a parrot and the kid is just going to mimic everything that you say and not really understand how to utilize that in a real life situation. But if you answer, give them a question, they're going to have time to think and process. And that's a huge benefit for them. But as a parent also not responding to like, oh my gosh, stop. This is always, you're always bragging. You're always talking about yourself. No, like you really want people to know that you're good at things. That's important to you. Um, I wonder if you would be interested to know what things that they're good at. So kind of not being alarmed, not feeling too emotional about if you're, you feel like your kid is a braggy kid and narcissist and having narcissist tendencies, you know, it's fine. So just keeping that a mental note because your reaction also is going to impact them and they may start to internalize emotions about their self. So um, a component of ADHD also is um, internalization for inattentive type and hyper and externalization for hyperactivity impulsivity. Um, typically, which doesn't, that doesn't mean that a hyperactive impulsive kid won't internalize because that's true. Um, it's just more common for an inattentive kid to internalize feelings. This means they won't tell you about a lot of things and over a certain time, they may appear to be great and everything is good and then they'll blow up. Um, the kid that externalizes is that kid that's always saying mean things or um, maybe having more temper tantrums, more, more blowing up, typically that they're expressing their emotions outwardly um, without processing them. So it's just a fun fact. Um, Self-centeredness kind of goes similar to that narcissistic behavior. Um, those are very similar concepts. So same, same type of response that you're going to have. Tantrums uh, are kind of what I talked about earlier. When I have a tantrum, I'm trying to communicate something to you. There's a difference between a tantrum and a meltdown. The meltdown is biologically driven, which means that once I hit a certain, something has happened, whatever trigger it is, 
um, if we're working uh, meltdowns work on a, a bell curve. So at the bottom, I'm starting to have it. The triggers like right here. Once I pass right here, there's no coming back. I'm going all the way to the top of the bell curve. There's nothing that you can do to calm me down. I have to self-regulate or figure it out. So talking to a kid, trying to get them to calm, calm down is a waste of your time. As long as they're safe, just let them come down by themselves. Once they get to the bottom, they'll probably will need safe space. They'll probably need time to kind of get back frontal lobe and rationale and reasoning and all that stuff. Um, and that's the time to talk about like preventatives, not like what happened. Like they maybe they don't know. <laughs> um, what can we do next time? Is there anything that I can help you with? Um, I wonder if, that felt really hard for you. Um, Cause you, sometimes the direct questions that you think are super logical don't make sense for kids. Um, because that you're acting, so you're, you may be asking such a direct question that they feel pressured to figure it out or they just don't have an answer, but you feel like it's pretty logical and they're like a child and they don't have an adult brain. So sometimes your reasoning is not, you need to come down to their level because children, not little adults, they're children. Um, so the language that you're using and sometimes the direct questions and the logic and reasoning just always may not apply. So just keeping that in mind as well. Um, and it could look like when you have that like processing conversation of this meltdown, it may need to be like an hour from now. Um, kids, if your kid is one of those that have difficulty with memory recall, we want, probably want to do it sooner than later, but we still want to give them space because sometimes kids will be like, I don't know. I don't even remember that, um, meltdown. Oftentimes it's not that they don't remember. It's because they feel really ashamed and they don't want to talk about it and they don't want to relive something that they can't control. So most of the times when I work with kids, some of them, um, like make a choice, they'll tell themselves that I don't want to remember that. And then like they put it in their unconscious and they like they intentionally do that, like put it back there and like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't remember it. And they are, they have the ability to do that. And then they don't remember. Um, and then some kids that makes me feel ashamed. Like, I don't want to talk about that. So we don't want to make them feel ashamed in those moments. Um, so I'm, kind of got off track, but just trying to describe the difference between a meltdown and a tantrum. A tantrum is driven for an outcome. A meltdown is not driven for an outcome. Um, they could be filling on the floor and you give them what they want and it doesn't matter. A tantrum is going to be you give them what they want and then all of a sudden they stop. Um, so that tantrums are usually due to the reaction of no. I don't like no and I don't that gives me a sense of rejection. Like you rejected me, like I'm not good enough or um, I'm not worth this. So that no kind of projects off rejection. So being able to keep in mind like why they're saying, um, why you're saying no and why they reacted um, is important for you to know that it may not just because I just want, I just want to do this to piss you off as a parent. Like, I just want to piss you off and I'm going to be really annoying. And like, especially if it, this is a public place, like it's a sense of rejection. Um, it can be a sense attention seeking, but I hate that word. I usually use um, connection seeking. So it's usually not attention. If they're trying to get their, your attention, it, it means they're trying to connect to you. They need you to see them. They need you to understand that, I don't know, that YouTube show that you can't let them watch um, really matters to them right now because maybe that's their way of decompressing after school. Um, so just keeping in mind, like whatever you're saying no to, it probably has a lot of meaning to them. It doesn't apply for all things. Like this, I can't think of a very simple example, but something simple and you're just like, that doesn't have a lot of meaning. You said like the word, no, that's just rejection. Um, if it is like, hey, you said no, and there was something like, you don't get it. You weren't able to understand how this hurt my feelings. Um, you really want to connect with them and help yourself understand how they're feeling in those moments. Um, solo play or activities. Kids that have ADHD like solo play sometimes because they get to control it. Um, they get to be in their own world and people don't get to tell them what to do. And because of they sometimes have elaborate things going on in their mind, they want to be able to act it out without anybody disrupting that. So it's not a red flag. It just means that 
they're in their own world, especially inattentive kids, kids that are very, they present themselves as shy, shy, excuse me, more shy. Um, they are around, they like to, ha they have elaborate imaginations. Those kids that are definitely those daydreamers, their imagination is just amazing and so big. So when they're playing by themselves, it's like, I have this idea. I don't want you to mess it up. I want to like implement this and I just want to do it by myself. And maybe just right now I want to have some control because that outside in the real world, I struggle with so many things. I don't have any control. So let me play by myself where I have control and even peers or parents don't get to tell me what to do. So that is usually why they may play alone. Um, that's not always the case, but it's definitely very common. And it's not big of a deal. It's um, it's good for them to be able to control some aspects because that their outside world feels like it's chaotic. Okay. Next, I'm going to try to stop soon. Executive functioning, we kind of already talked about that, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But overall, yes, ADHD is executive functioning disorder. Um, working memory, self-talk, um, organization, time management, initiating tasks, shifting between tasks um, are just some, there's probably like 10, I think, but those are a few examples of executive functioning skills. So all of these require all of these skills require you to function in daily life. So if I struggle with any of these and a majority of these, my ability to function every day is really difficult. So knowing that you need these to go to school, wake up, do daily living activities, make friends, like all of these things, a kid with ADHD is like impacted by a majority of them at one time, all the time, every day. And if I feel that way, it is very hard for me. And understanding the difficulty from a person that doesn't have ADHD is gonna be a mind shift because you have to get how they're functioning in daily life. And go to the next one. So I kind of have walked through some examples with you guys just to give you a few as I was talking. Um, one of my biggest things is like connecting. You need to connect with your kid. You need to understand their experience. Um, you need to validate their feelings. Uh, some and, and giving them, because they don't have control, giving them some control, which I use choices, um, a model in CPRT, it's called ACT. So we give them choices because sometimes it feels like somebody's always telling them what to do. Um, but the choices also implicate consequences. So what that means is if they're doing a behavior that is inappropriate or not helpful, um, they can continue to do that behavior or they have the choice to do something else, right? Um, and continuing doing that behavior, it the other choice is the consequence, right? Um, or you can give them two choices before they start to do a behavior that's difficult. Um, but all the time, instead of you being the one that's responsible for their consequence, they are responsible for it because that they're the they're the ones that get to pick the choice. So if they continue jumping on the couch, then they have chosen not to have their iPad or they have chosen not to get whatever you guys, whatever you do in your household. So it's really kind of based on your and how you do consequences. So you continue to do this behavior, then you're choosing to do X, Y, and Z. So if they keep doing it, it's like, oh, well, you've chosen to do this. That's teaching them responsibility. A lot of times kids with ADHD don't like to take responsibility. Um, I do really focus on the connection. I think it's important, but just because you're connecting with your kid and validating their feeling doesn't mean you get super soft um, because that they will try to manipulate you a lot of times. Um, that's a kid thing, but that's all, also an ADHD thing because I'm trying to do the path of least resistance because the path of not least resistance takes more mental energy and I'm already limited on mental energy when it comes to things that I don't want to do. Um, and the reason is like the brain in the ADHD brain has like much higher like reward system. So for things that I don't want to do, it takes like two to three times more energy than a person that doesn't have ADHD. So of course, when you, you know, when they're choosing the path of least resistance, it's not because they're trying to 
specifically get on your nerves. They're actually just trying to figure out a way that's easiest for them, which can look like manipulation. But um, when we're giving them the choices and they're choosing the consequence, they're learning to take responsibility for their own actions. And they're learning um, that life has consequences and they can't just do whatever they want to, especially that impulsive kid that just does things without thinking. They need a lot of help too. And giving those choices is going to help them kind of stop and think. Um, it'll also help you not get even more frustrated because <laughs> it gives you a little bit of time to like respond, which gives you more time not to just um, yell at them because you're upset. So if you reflect the feeling, the first thing is doing, you're stopping and thinking, and then you're able to not just respond to them out of your impulsivity or frustration. And then by you val validating their feeling and connecting with them, you recognize why they're doing what they're doing. So then it takes you time to mentally think, and then you step into, okay, these are the choices that you have, but you have to be super firm with ADHD. They call it like the robot parent where you do like, you do empathize, you do connect, but you can't be wavering. You have to be consistent because if you're not consistent, you're going to get the responses. The responses that you don't want will keep happening. And there's nothing that anybody can do unless that you are consistent and you maintain like firm boundaries with them and have like set the expectations because expectations are good forms of communication. If you have some magical expectations in your head from your kid that have never been verbalized, and even if they're verbalized, does it mean that they understand it? No. They have to, you guys sometimes have to sit down and have conversations with your kid about like, what is the expectation for your household? What do you expect them to do in regards to like um, talking, communicating, um, routines, um, whatever? you have in your household that's important to you if they don't know those things then your expectation that you have is invalid like you can't even put that on your kid um, because then that's not fair so if i am your boss and i'm expecting all these things of you and then you don't do them and then he's pissed off at you well whose fault is it really it's your boss's fault it's not yours same thing with your kid. You have to think in that mindset. You have to verbalize a lot of things and communicate that because that even with the social cues, they're not picking up on when you're irritated sometimes or like if you expected them to do something or you're upset um, or even to connect the dots between like this equals this. This is like common sense. They may not pick up on that. They're not paying attention. So if you don't spell it out and you're very clear um, you're going to be disappointed more times than anything. And your disappointment is going to impact your kid. So it is a lot of work. It's a lot of effort um, to have a kid that experiences ADHD. Um, but if you know ahead of time that these things are going to be difficult and will take lots of patience and knowing what to expect of your kid, things usually become less frustrating because uh, your expectations change. Not to say that they come lower, but they just change. They shift. Um, you understand things. Your mindset is different. So then you respond differently. You know your own um, lagging skills and your own weaknesses. And you're able to work on those to help your kid. Um, these are all really important things. My biggest thing when working with parents is really a mindset shift. There's lots of tools and all that stuff is really helpful. But until you shift your mindset on understanding your kid and their difficulty and what their life is like every day and how you may be attributing to some of these difficulties, I don't care what tool you have, it won't matter. Um, it'll matter for the short term and it won't be really effective in the long in the long run. So keeping those things on the forefront in mind um, is really helpful. Some like simple things are, I'm not, reward charts are cool, but they're there to initiate behavior. They're not there to maintain behavior. Kids with ADHD are going to get bored out of their minds with a reward chart, um, unless you switch it, like you, the certain rewards. Um, I utilize this with parents to start a behavior. They need help with that. You want them to do something different? We, they need a little rewards. They need a little bit of something to get them started um in order to help them and then you have like different types of accomplishments or goals two of them if you have five two of them need to be something that they can do every day if not then like you have like 
five or three things that are really hard for them and then don't meet it. And then oh, there goes their self-esteem lowering and lowering. So you want to make sure if there's like four or five, whatever, half of them are things they came up with themselves. And you're not just pushing this on them like, oh, we're going to do one. Here's the five things that you need to work on. No, it's a teamwork effort. You want to know their thoughts. They get to pick the reward. You're giving them control. It's a collaborative effect. Like it is important that their voice is heard and they also see the benefit and they they get to express to you like, yeah, I have a really hard time getting up in the morning or I have a really hard time taking 10 minutes to brush my teeth instead of looking in the mirror for 30 minutes, like <laughs> brushing my teeth when it should only take five or six minutes. It's like, yes, I need help with that mom or dad. Like, yes, I want to work on this. Yes, this is important to me. Yes, it's hard for me when I come home to school and I have a meltdown and I have to look at homework. I want that to get better. They have to have motivation. That's important. They have to have their own motivation. You can definitely bribe them and do all of that fun stuff. And then once the bribery stops, then it just goes back. So knowing that they have some type of motivation for themselves is going to be really helpful. I know I'm running out of time and I want to give you guys questions. Um, so I think the last thing I will talk about is medication. Um, just for the simple fact that a lot of questions I get from parents is, is medication um, the best thing? So I'm going to just give straight up research because it's not my opinion to be able to tell you about medication, but um, medication and, and therapy are the most effective treatment for ADHD. And some kids respond better to medication than others. Um, some kids can respond just as much to therapy as medication. Some kids just need medication because that the other areas are um, doing well. The, the issue overall with all of some of this is there's ADHD, which is the executive functioning part, which medication can only fix. Then there's what happens when you have ADHD and we call those sub-symptoms. So people with ADHD, like I can't give a percentage, but it's extremely high. Um, they have anxiety, they have depression, they have self-esteem, self-confidence issues, um, relationship issues. Like they have all of these issues that are not um, part of the criteria of ADHD, right? So medication can't do anything about that. So if your kid is experiencing that, um, those other sub-symptoms, like keeping in mind, like once we start medication and you expect like this magically everything to get better is very unrealistic and will not happen. Um, if your kid is struggling in school and it's almost like they, you know, can't function, their self-esteem is really low. Um, in that regard, I've seen a lot of kids significantly benefit from medication, especially when they're experiencing such a low self-esteem due to their ability to function in environments that are important to them, school, sports, et cetera. Um, sometimes, you know, you'll try therapy first. If it's not working to the way that you want it to work, then medication can be a follow-up option. Sometimes you can start medication and then um, do therapy right after you start medication. Uh, it just depends on work, what's worked best for you. Like I said, the research heavily supports uh, medication as a beneficial treatment for ADHD because it is the only thing that treats those actual, like actual executive function symptoms. You can work on them with certain strategies and routines, but like to treat it in the brain, the only thing that works is medication. Um, and that's what, when you see like a Adderall or whatever, all it's doing is helping the child focus, um, which then again is going to help them with some of their memory, help them with the relationships, but it doesn't change those other things that they're struggling with. So what I mostly tell my parents, consult with a psychiatrist or a neurologist. That doesn't mean you have to start medication. It just means you get a consultation. You get better understanding of like how this may impact your child. They have genetic testing as well for more of anxiety, depression medications if your child is also on something like that, but also for ADHD. Um, it's changed a little bit in the last five years, but overall it is um, helpful sometimes to get 
that genetic testing from your psychiatrist or neurologist. So I have talked a lot and I just want to give um, any parents any time to ask any questions on things that I did touch on. Keep in mind, this was an hour of a really big topic. So I tried to do the best at just giving you guys some general information to help you understand, well, first ADHD, what your kid may be experiencing, um, and also some to help your kid within those moments.